Okay, well this is Dr. Martin, and uh, this is the uh, uh, the fourth uh, DSD lecture, and um, so this is uh, uh, going to pick up where we left off on Friday, and uh, just continue going through Unit uh, Two in the book. So um, let me just quickly refer to the syllabus, and I'll, I'm going to shrink me down and bring up the syllabus and we'll scroll to where we have the, the schedule and so here I am the third last day of August and we're um, into uh, you know into uh, unit two 212 through 215 I'm not sure uh, how close that is, but anyway, that's a, that's where we are roughly. Okay, and uh, you'll notice that uh, the first homework assignment is going to be due on Wednesday, so be sure and be working on that. And uh, Wednesday, I'll probably uh, talk about some of those problems briefly. Okay, uh, let me just pick up this real quick, and we'll uh, do that. And so this is uh, close to where we left off. And then I'm going to do this real quick. Okay. So, um, so remember we talked about uh, two different procedural assignments. So we have the continuous assignments, uh, and there, the, those all those statements execute continuously, which means no matter where they are in your in your program, they will execute. And they will, uh, whenever any signal on the right side changes, it updates the left side. Procedural assignments, on the other hand, are uh, conditional. And there are two types, initial statements and always statements. Now, for most things, the initial statements are really mostly used in the test benches and not so much in building, uh, making integrated circuits. Uh, because you don't really get to specify the initial conditions without creating a whole bunch of circuitry to actually make that happen. Um, however, uh, in programming FPGAs, because we do uh, get to write in a bit file, uh, we do get to specify the initial conditions. So, so we can use initial statements uh, in Vivado for programming the Xilinx FPGAs. And, uh, <clears throat> And so, so we can use them, and these execute one time at the very beginning uh, when you when when the uh, when the power is applied. Basically, uh, that's a little bit of a simplification, and and, and eventually I understand uh, why that's a simplification. But for now, just accept the fact that that when you're when you power up your device, uh, these initial statements are executed once, and then not again. Uh, the always statements, however, have their standard form is this always at sensitivity list, and when any signal inside the sensitivity list changes, then uh, then this always block will execute. And then within this always block, there will be so sequential statements, and these can, there, there can be order issues related to these things, uh, so, uh, so we do have to um, pay attention to that. Uh, Okay, so uh, so in so in your sensitivity list, if you have ABC signals ABC, then if any one of these changes, it would execute. Uh, the uh, in the old days, you can see sensitivity lists where it'll say A or B or C. Uh, this or was was not really intended to be an OR gate or anything. It was uh, it was just a way of writing it. But when they came up with the new um, standard for Verilog, the IEEE standard in 2001, uh, you could replace the OR with a comma. And, uh, and that's also now uh, acceptable in the sensitivity list. Don't confuse sensitivity lists with the module port list. Those are totally different. Uh, these, these procedural assignments Appear within modules. They don't. Uh, they don't appear all by themselves or anything like that. Uh, 
they're, they're not standalone uh, functions. So we see these um, we see these uh, inside modules, and uh, the sensitivity list is just a, a, a signal that triggers the execution of this, and it has nothing to do with connecting to outside the module or anything like that. Although uh, sometimes these these blocks can uh, deal with signals that are part of the port list, but anyway, okay. So. Sorry, I didn't get that right. All right. Um, so, again, concurrent statements are used in an always block. Uh, and just the fact that they're in the always, the always block makes them sequential. Um, so when the right side, so when these statements exist in an always block, even if the right side changes, it does not trigger the execution um, of these, uh, of the always, uh, of the statement only the sensitivity list triggers the execution of the always block. Okay, and then once that happens, then these sequential statements are evaluated and executed, depending. And uh, <clears throat> we have one more concept we're gonna, we'll introduce, and that is uh, this equal sign. Sometimes we'll use an equal sign, and sometimes we'll use an equal sign with a, uh, with a greater than sign. And we, we talk about those as blocking and non-blocking uh, statements within these always blocks. Okay, so, um, okay, so we can, and I, I mentioned this on Friday, we can use sensitivity, uh, we can use uh, combinational statements. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna expand this. We can use uh, always blocks to create non-sequential regular old combinational logic, even though that's not really what they were intended for, but that is something that we can do. And uh, so because of that, um, you always have to, because we allow this, this essentially bastardized use of these always blocks, uh, you always have to kind of be on your toes. Uh, you, it is certainly, not the case that you have to use them for that and in fact um, you can avoid that use entirely which I would sort of recommend for the most part but because it's allowed you you do have to pay attention and uh, so it there are a couple of issues that you have to keep in mind first off if you do use an always block not to create sequential logic which is really what they're pretty much intended for but you use it instead to create combinational logic that's fine. They, you were allowed to use them in that manner, even though that's not what they were originally intended for. But what happens is, uh, if you don't do it correctly, you will inadvertently create sequential logic you didn't intend. And that's the tricky part. So, uh, and we call that creating a latch that you didn't intend. And we will cover this somewhat extensively. All right, anyway. So, enough said about that. I'm going to shrink back down and we'll, we're going to keep rolling along here. So, <clears throat> uh, you can model both combinational and sequential logic in these process blocks, but you need to be very careful with the combinational logic. Uh, it's preferable to realize these gates using your standard old uh, concurrent statements. But if you want to use always blocks, that does actually allow you to use some some uh, language constructs that you can't use otherwise. One of those would be things like uh, a case statement or if statements and some things like that. And that's why, I guess that's why people do it. In any event, um, so that's part of what's going on there. All right, so so here's an example. We have a, we have a module, so this is the port list. These signals would connect to either other modules of the outside world and these are specified as input and output. In this case, note that D and E are specified as registers. Now, <clears throat> why did we do that? Well, the reason we did that is because inside of, inside of an always block, the left-hand side has to be a register. So the fact that these statements appear in an always block means you must have designated D and E as registers. 
now here's the, and notice we're using the A or B or C notation here. Uh, I don't ever use that. I recommend you don't either, but you may see existing modules using this notation. Remember, this in this sensitivity list, this OR statement is really just, it represents just a comma, okay? It's not really sort of an OR gate or anything. Um, and then you have begin and end. You have a five nanosecond delay. And again, because it's on this side, it's a propagation delay. And then the signal D is equal to A, logically ordered with B, which as long as they're just bits, which they are, none of them are specified as vectors, then it's the same as the, the logical uh, OR here is the same as the bitwise OR. It doesn't really matter for single bits. Um, and then you have D and E. <clears throat> okay, now a couple things. So this executes one time, this always block, whenever any of the signals in the sensitivity list change. So, so when D changes, it doesn't trigger the execution of this because D is not in the sensitivity list. So D can change and it won't trigger this. Uh, which you might think, well, it's, that's interesting. So in this particular case, E would stay at the old value even though D changes. The truth of the matter is though, uh, and this is where, this is partly what makes Verilog so different than a standard computer language, because you're, you're actually creating hardware. Sometimes the, sometimes the synthesizer will look at that and say, okay, First off, we don't have edge signals up here on the sensitivity list, so the synthesizer is already, already sort of thinking that you're probably using this in the bastardized way to create combinational logic, not sequential logic. So because of that, it's, it's going to um, it's, it's, it's gonna, uh, be thinking that this is really intended to be two gates, two OR gates, A and B OR together giving you D, and C and D OR together giving you E. Because, because that's kind of what the synthesizer's thinking. Uh, even though you left D out of the sensitivity list here, it's probably going to give you a warning and go ahead and synthesize two gates. Notice also that even though you specify D and E to be registered, when this turns into combinational logic, in combinational logic in our standard assignment statement, the left-hand side has to be a wire. So these registers won't actually be created by the synthesizer. They will instead be changed into wires. And what it will create, it won't create a, a procedural block. It'll create two gates, two OR gates, with A and B in for D and C and D in for E. And they won't be registers, they'll be wires. So this is another reason why I don't really like it being used in this bastardized manner because What's written here is not really what happens. But again, people do this all the time, apparently. And so, um, so I guess it's, you know, it's permissible. Okay. All right, and let's see, moving on here. All right, now we're gonna talk about blocking and non-blocking assignments. This, this is one of the most confusing things for most students. Um, most students look at this and they just start pulling their hair out. Oh, so, but it actually is not a big deal. Um, and it can come in very handy. Within a procedural block, normally, uh, most of the time when we intend it to be used as it's intended to be used as a sequential, uh, part of the sequential design, where it's really gonna be triggered by a clock or a reset or a clear or something like that, we would normally use within that always block non-blocking assignments. But there are times when you want something to happen first within that procedural block before you allow other things to happen. And in that case, you can make that assignment statement blocking. When you make them blocking then, the order in which they appear in the always block then makes a difference. And the always block will then execute sequentially and it will completely finish a blocking statement before it executes the next statement. Now we're going to show you another ex several examples where this makes a difference in how how things work. But just keep in mind, most of the time, 
when you intend for your always block to result in uh, sequential logic, you would normally, but not always, use non-blocking statements. And when you intend for your always block to result in combinational logic, using it in that bastardized manner that you can do, uh, you would typically use blocking statements. Okay, and there you go. Okay, so we'll see some examples. Um, okay, so when we want a blocking statement, we use just the equal sign. When we want the non-blocking type statement, we use the, uh, sorry, I say greater than, it's less than equals. Uh, it points, through, I was thinking the other way. Anyway, uh, so we use this operator. And it allows us to evaluate assignments without blocking the sequential flow. In other words, several assignments can be evaluated at the same time. So when you, when you use this, the order doesn't so much matter. When you use this, the order does matter. Okay, so now we have um, some examples of blocking and non-blocking. All right, so first off, notice in this, in this uh, always block, we've used blocking statements. In this always block, we've used non-blocking always statements because here we just use an equal sign and here we use the less than equal sign. Sort of represents an arrow pointing to the left, basically. And notice up here, in both cases we have a clock. So in both cases, we're, we're seriously intending for these to be sequential logic, not to be used in this bastardized manner. So notice here we have B being assigned to A and then A being assigned to B. Now, what happens in this case uh, is that this statement, because it comes first, will block the execution of the following statement until this statement is executed. So when, when, when the positive edge of the clock occurs and it triggers the execution of this always block, then the value of B will be assigned to A. And then once that occurs, the current value, the updated new value of A, which happens to be B, will be assigned to B. So basically when we're done, A and B will be the same. In this one, also triggered by the positive edge of the clock, but because these are not blocking, both of these will begin to execute simultaneously. And so D will be assigned to C, and C will be assigned to D. So in this always block, C and D are going, are going to exchange their values. This C here will not be the updated C because this is not a blocking statement, which means both of these will execute with their current values of D and C simultaneously, and C and D will be updated simultaneously so that we will essentially take whatever happens to be in D and it's gonna to go to C. Whatever happens to be in C is gonna to go to D. So when we're all done, D and C will have exchanged their contents with each other. Here, A and B will be the same. So it, it does make some difference, and sometimes we'll, we'll use, sometimes we'll use a, a blocking statement and then some non-blockings in the same always block. Okay. So, and if you assume the initial values, uh, so A and C equal one, B and D equal zero. Uh, okay, so if so, in this case, since B equals zero, A is going to go to zero before this one executes. In which case, A now is zero, and B will be assigned zero again. So they'll both be zero. Here, uh, D is uh, D is uh, zero. So C will get the value zero. And C starts off as 1, so D will become 1. So it, when we're all done, C will be 0 and D will be 1. So the values will be switched here, and here they'll be made the same. So, the non-blocking statements will, will all start evaluating uh, at the same time. And so in this case then, C winds up as zero and D winds up as one. 
they switch. All right. So, an always block will be activated. Let's see, put this on here. An always block will be activated if one of the events occurs. In the combinational logic, the sensitivity list includes all signals that are used in the conditional statement. All right, so <clears throat> now, so what this is saying, and again, uh, this, uh, I just, I, I pull my hair out to some degree because I, I don't know why they allow this bastardized use. It's not necessary, but it, it's, uh, it's just an abused feature of the language. And uh, you don't need to use it ever. But if you're going to use it, here's what happens. Uh, so when you intend combinational logic, you have to put all the signals that are going to be on the right-hand side in the always block so that they will trigger execution of the always block. Now, having said that, I, I already mentioned on a previous slide that the synthesizer will often look at this and give you a warning and go ahead and, and, and create what it thinks you intended, even though that, you know, because that's really, to do anything else becomes very difficult. So it, it generally will just go ahead and make the assumption what you intended. Uh, and this, this is also partly why you, why you can't learn this language without actually writing some code. Because you, what you think will happen in some of these cases, the synthesizer sort of overrules your thoughts and does what it thinks you intended. Uh, so anyway, and one of the ways we do this uh, is sometimes what we, uh, you'll see there's a little shorthand notation for this uh, where we can uh, put a star in, which includes, we do at star and it includes all the signals. The sensitivity list in a sequential circuit uh, contains three kinds of edge triggered signals, uh, clocks, resets, and set signal events. And all the signals in the sensitivity list either have to be level signals like you would expect if you intend it for combinational logic, or they all have to be trigger, uh, edge triggered signals. All right, now we're gonna talk again about wire and register. We, we only sort of touched on this. So we have two main data types you're gonna come in contact with, wire and register. And the data type wire is basically used where there's just a wire needed between the output of one gate and the input for something else. The data type register is used where the assignment data needs to be stored until the next assignment. And typically this results in a latch or a flip-flop. So if you want to assign your output in sequential code within an always block, you have to declare the left side as a register. Otherwise, in all your concurrent statements, all your standard assigned statements, the left-hand side has to be a wire. So just that's probably the easiest way to remember. Within an always block, left-hand side must be a register. Even if it's not going to wind up as a register, you still have to start it out that way. And then the synthesizer will kind of use that always block and then still create sequential uh, combination logic, which would result in the left-hand side being a wire. Wherever you have your standard assignment statements not in always blocks, then the left-hand side has to be a wire. Okay. Oh, okay. The wire can never be can can uh, can it's used only in modeling combination logic, and it has to be driven by something, typically a gate or it can be the output of a, well, typically a gate. Uh, it could be the output of a ROM or something like that too. A wire can't be used as the left-hand side in an always block, regardless of whether you're doing blocking or non-blocking. The left-hand side in an always block must be a register. And again, in the assignment statement, the left-hand side has to be a wire. So. Assignment statement, left-hand side has to be a wire. Sequential statements, left-hand side has to be a register. So the register can be used to model both combinational and sequential logic. It's the only legal type on the left-hand side 
of either a blocking or a non-blocking within an always block. Register is the only legal type on the left-hand side of an initial block, which we normally use in test benches, or to set initial conditions for an FPGA. Register cannot be used on the left-hand side of an assigned statement. So when you have a standard combinational assignment statement outside of an always block, the left-hand side can't be a register. So really, the simple way to remember this is inside always blocks, left-hand side register, outside always blocks, left-hand side wire. And that pretty much sums it up. Um, but you'll find yourself forgetting this, and you'll get errors, and then you'll have to fix it. Remember, when you use it in that bastardized manner in always block, you have to designate it as a register even though it doesn't wind up as a register. Uh, and again, kind of crazy, right? I, I don't really like that, but, but that's how it is. So there are some other data types besides these, but uh, these are the main ones. Okay. So flip-flops. So what kind of logic are flip-flops? Are they combinational logic or sequential logic? They are sequential logic. They have a clock, usually an edge trigger clock, uh, and you have to use an always block for flip-flops. So here's what this looks like. This is a very simple um, uh, flip-flop. It's just a D flip-flop, and we don't even have a Q prime output or anything. It's, there's no set or reset. If, they, if those signals existed, they would have to be edge triggered signals, and they would have to show up in the always, in the sensitivity list. This pause edge clock is, that's a rising edge clock. Now remember back in our, in our logic design days when we looked at VHDL, uh, we would just have clock in the sensitivity list, and then in, down here in the body of the, of the procedural block, uh, which is the same thing in VHDL as the always block in Verilog, down here in the body, we would use that, that idiom uh, clock tick event and then we would say clock equals one or zero and that would tell you whether it's rising edge or falling edge. They didn't play that game with Verilog. That may be one of the primary reasons why Verilog's more popular. I don't know. But here we just say pause edge. So there's no real confusion. It's a positive edge. Pure and, pure and plain and simple. Okay, so whenever the clock has a positive edge this will trigger the execution of the always block, and Q will be updated to reflect the current value of D. Q already may equal D, so nothing would change. R, D may have changed in the, in the meantime, and Q will be updated. Okay, simple flip-flop, and this is what it would look like. No Q prime, because we didn't specify that. All right, now we're gonna look at the code for a transparent latch. Um, all right, so a transparent latch has a gate. In this case, it's the G. We have an input D and an output Q. When the gate is active, then whatever D is, Q immediately becomes. If D changes, Q follows it. When the gate is closed, then D can change, but Q will hold its, its value when the gate was closed. That's a transparent latch. Okay, so you could write it like this. Now notice here we have level signals. And we say always at G or D. Again, remember this isn't an OR gate. This is just the OR there is really used as a comma. Don't write it like this. Write G comma D. Uh, that's totally legal and that's really makes more sense in my view. Uh, in any event, there's the body. Begin. And then uh, if G, then Q is assigned uh, the value of D. And here you can use a, uh, yeah, you can use a blocking or a non-blocking. Wouldn't really matter. So if D changes, uh, this will execute. But if G is false or zero, then Q won't be updated because the gate's closed. All right. Why does D have to be in the sensitivity list? Well, if the gate's open and D changes, if it weren't in the sensitivity list, it wouldn't update. So it must be in the list. Because if G is 
oh, if the gate's open, if G is true, then you want D to trigger the execution that's always blocked because D could change several times while Q, uh, sorry, while the gate is open, while G is true. All right. So um, here's a D flip flop with an asynchronous clear. Now, uh, so here's our flip flop clock, edge trigger clock, a D input, a Q out, and an active low clear, edge triggered. So since the asynchronous clear knot signal overrides the clock, clear knot is tested first. So, so here's our code. Now notice we have uh, in, this, in this always block, our sensitivity list has two edge signals. Remember, you can't mix level signals and edge signals in the same sensitivity list. At least you can't in Vivado. Uh, it, it's entirely possible that uh, in uh, if you're writing very low code for cadence, uh, you might you might be allowed to do this because it's possible that you might make a part like that in an integrated circuit. But it it won't happen on an FPGA because of the way things are put together. So Vivado doesn't let you do that. So in Vivado, you have to do edge trigger signals. Uh, and again, that's another one of the little interesting things about Verilog is that you don't necessarily, it, it's very much synthesizer dependent. So when you're using Vivado and you have experience with Vivado, you, you'll begin to learn what the synthesizer allows and doesn't allow. Uh, but if you were using a different um, integrated development environment, say to make integrated circuits, or even to program maybe different FPGAs, you might you might have you might have a, a number of situations where you could do things which you wouldn't be able to do in Vivado. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so this is unlike the, the C language. Say, well, there are some exceptions. Obviously, when you're programming a PIC chip, you can't write a function call that can call itself. Where is in C, that's really legal. But uh, but the implementation implementation of C in the mid-level picks uh, is, um, is not fully compliant. So, so that's part of that story. All right, so anyway, so here's always block. We have two edge trigger signals, clock, pause edge clock, and neg edge clear knot. So when the clear falls, that's when it resets the flip-flop, clears it. And when the clock rises, that's when it triggers execution of this. And uh, but notice within this body of the always block, we have a, an if statement. If clear not, or if, if, clear, if clear not inverted, that tilde is the bitwise inverse. They could have also used an exclamation point and done the logical inverse. So if clear not is zero, which means that with the tilde it becomes one. So if it's true, then Q is set to zero, cleared. Else it's set to D. So if your clear is active, active low, it's a falling edge clear, but if it's active low, then uh, Q will be forced to clear. And this else phrase will not be executed since you test this first. Okay, so if else statements, so this is the general form. These are very similar to what we would find in C. First off, you're only allowed to use if-else statements inside uh, procedural blocks, initial blocks and uh, 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 always blocks. So you can only use them in, in, in procedural blocks. And generally, if you were using it in, a, in an initial block, you'd probably be doing it in a test bench, I would guess. Not really. You, I can't imagine wh how you would have conditional initializations, um, <clears throat> but I guess you could. Um, you could have certain constants that you could change, which would reconfigure your code. Maybe I don't know. But anyway, uh, but 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 they're only legal in in within always blocks and initial statements. You cannot use them in the general flow of your code. Uh, they're not legal there. And Sorry. Uh, okay, what happened? Let's see. Let me get this. So, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. All right. So um, the more general form is if, and there's a condition, and then you have sequential statements, else if, condition, sequential statements. Notice, sequential statements. These are not legal with your, with your continuous assignment statements. And you can have more else if clauses if you want. Now, notice if, if the if condition is true, the else if, and you can have a, a number of them, and the else are never, are never executed. They're never evaluated. Only if, only if the if is true, and then as you go down, the else, the first else if, if it's true, then the rest of the else ifs would not be evaluated either. So, so there's a, so keep that in mind. Okay. Um, if you have it with, uh, within the if condition, if you have several sequential statements, you use, uh, you have to put in begin and end. Remember, I said uh, on Friday, that we, we pretty much use begin and end in, uh, in Verilog, just like we do curly braces uh, for most of the things in uh, C. So you can think of your begin and end as curly braces. And obviously, if you just have a single statement, you can put it all on one line or whatever. Uh, but uh, And you put a semicolon at the end of the sequential statement. But if you have several sequential statements, then you have to put a begin and an end. Just like in C, you would use curly braces. All right, here's a D flip flop with a synchronous clear. So why is this called a synchronous clear? Well, because it only takes effect when the clock, at, when the positive edge of the clock occurs. So when you assert the, the clear knot, so when you take the clear line low, it doesn't immediately clear the flip-flop. It has to wait until the next clock edge, and then it will clear it. So that makes it synchronous. Notice then that the clear knot is not in the sensitivity list. So it's basically like this. It's basically putting an AND gate and a clear knot going through an inverter because you have to flip it because it's active low. And Mm, yeah, well, if it's clear, well, anyway, that's a little confusing. But uh, but if the clear is high, then the D would pass through. Whereas if the clear is low, then uh, then the the AND gate's going to output a zero and it's going to clear the flip flop. Okay. So. Uh, so here's a, so this is back to the SM charts. So what's an equivalent use of a, uh, of an, so here's a, here's an example of, uh, of nested L if and else if statements. So we have um, if C1 begin S1, S2 and else if C2 begin S3, S4 and else if C3 and so forth. And this is what the SM chart would look like. So you first test C1. If it's true, you're done, and you assert S1 and S2. If it's false, then you test at C2. If it's true, now you're done, and you assert S3 and S4. If it's false, you drop through to C3. If it's true, you assert 5 and 6, and if it's false, you assert 7 and 8. And that's it. So this 7 and 8 then become the else clause. And this is an if else, if else, and that's an if. Okay, here's a JK flip-flop um, with a, a direct set and a reset or a clear. So we have a, a reset not active low, a set not active low, and they have bubbles going in. Our clock is a falling edge clock it's a JK flip-flop and it has a Q and a Q knot. All right, and let's see. I'll put me back in here. So um, maybe I shouldn't. So uh, and let me do, fix this over here. 
Okay, yeah, there's a couple things. So, so this is a JK flip-flop. This is what it looks like right here. It's got a set knot, a reset knot, a JK, a clock, a Q, and a Q knot. Now, remember, this is our port list. That list doesn't tell us whether those signals are inputs or outputs. We still have to specify that. And it also doesn't tell us whether or not they are registers. In this case, uh, they, uh, we specified the set knot, the reset knot, the J, the K, and the clock as inputs, and the outputs are Q and Q knot. Now notice, uh, we could have called them registers, but we didn't. But here, we are going to make a register Q int. Now this is, this is kind of interesting, the way this is done. Um, so down here, when we get through with all the flip-flop stuff in the always block, notice we have two continuous assignments. The, assi the continuous assignments, what's the right-hand side, uh, sorry, what's the left-hand side have to be? It has to be a wire. So all these signals up here are wires. And they're always driven by something. In case of the inputs, the inputs are driven by whatever this is connected to. So the input, the set knot's driven by an input. The reset knot's driven by an input. The JK are driven. The clock is driven. So somewhere there's a clock generator. The outputs, uh, however, have to be driven by something inside this module. And uh, and so they're driven. They're driven by this register which is really the flip-flop. So when we say assign Q equals Q int and assign Q naught equals the inverse of Q int, these concurrent statements, they're always executing continuously. So whenever Q int changes, it drives the execution of these. Q int only changes inside this always block. Because it's in an always block, Q int has to be a register. So we have the sensitivity list, negative edge of the clock, negative edge of the reset, and negative edge of the set knot. And uh, then we have an if statement. We first test the reset. Of course, we have to invert it because it's active low. And uh, if it's true, we're going we're gonna to set the register Q int to, to zero. We're going to clear it. If it's else if, it's if the set knot is true, then we're going to set Q int to a one. And then if neither one of those are true, then we will test this one, uh, in which case we're going to use the, uh, this is the, this is basically the, uh, the characteristic equation, <clears throat> characteristic equation of a JK flip-flop. The next state of Q is J times Q prime, the current state, plus K prime times Q, the current state. And so, um, so that's, that's what's implemented here. That's just a standard JK flip-flop. Okay, so the, the, uh, the output Q and Q naught are the actual, these are the signals connected to the port list up here. The, uh, the Q int and the not Q int, that's, a, that's an internal register. That's actually the flip-flop. <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, Remember, the combinational output would never show up inside an always block. It's not legal in there. It's only legal. It's legal outside of always blocks, but not inside. The left-hand side inside always blocks must be registers. The left-hand side outside must be uh, wires. All right. Okay, so, so here's a wait statement. Now, uh, wait statements uh, are often used in, um, in our, our test benches, but they're legal in our straight line code too. And they can, they can, we, can, we can wait on a number of different things. So this is an always block. Doesn't have a sensitivity list. But what it does have are sequential statements, and then they execute until they hit a wait statement. And then it sits there until that wait statement satisfied. Then it executes more sequential statements, potentially, till it maybe hits another wait statement or not. And then uh, it waits there until that statement's satisfied. And then when that statement's satisfied, it drops through and starts over. 
execute sequential statements till it gets to the next wait statement. So this one just goes round and round uh, because there's no sensitivity list. It's always executing, but it's but it's being uh, but it's waiting on whatever wait statements and the wait statements would have some signal that it's waiting on either getting to a spe specified value if it's say it could be a vector it could be um, a single bit it could be a bunch of different things the wait statements used as a level sensitive event control so uh, so as opposed so typically typically you don't do edge signals in the wait statement so if th this wr uh, value here is uh, it's a it's going to be evaluated to either false or true if it's true then it drops through if it's false it waits it waits till it's true and here it's inverted so let's say wr starts off as zero so it would come here and, and it would wait when it becomes one this would be executed and then it would wait here until it goes back to zero and then it would drop through come around and wait here again until it goes to one and then it would do this and then it would sit here and wait until it went back to zero and then it would do this and it would just go cycle through those two options wait do this when it changes wait do that okay the golden rule for always with combinational logic okay so this is this is the this three golden rules so if you're going to use an always block for combinational logic uh, you need to keep these rules in mind and uh, there are three of them okay uh, although I think there's only two listed here maybe I've got another one oh hmm uh, okay well I'm not sure why there were three <laughs> I'm going to change this. Uh, anyway, so the golden rule for always with combinational logic. So this means you're going to take an always block. You're not going to use it to generate sequential logic that it was designed to create. You're going to use it instead to create combinational logic. So you really don't need to use it to do that. You could just be perfectly happy doing your combinational logic without it, uh, without the always block. But if you're going to use it for combinational logic, all inputs to design must appear in the sensitivity list. Don't leave anything that shows up in the always block out of the sensitivity list. And so there are no hidden signals inside the always block. And all variables must be assigned under all conditions. So, so any of your left hand assignments uh, can never be uh, left unassigned because uh, if, that, if they are, it will generate a latch. It will not generate combinational logic. You'll get something you didn't intend. And that's that's the pitfall when you want to use always blocks to make combinational logic in this, again, bastardized use. Okay, I think that gets us through this unit, and that's a good stopping place. We'll pick up with the next uh, chunk of slides on Wednesday. Uh, be sure and uh, be working on the homework. I'll talk about the homework on uh, in the lecture on Wednesday. And um, <clears throat> you can ask me questions in the help session. Uh, we'll have a help session. I, I will have office hours today at noon, uh, so feel free. And um, what else? Um, this week, the lab is going to be finishing up uh, lab one, which is that tutorial. Uh, hopefully, you have, uh, hopefully, you've gotten your, uh, your, your board signed out. And... Uh, if you haven't gotten your board signed out, make sure you go by the lab and uh, get one signed out uh, at 2 o'clock on Monday or 11.30 on Tuesday or 2 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, all right, let me know if you have any problems. I will have office hours today at noon, and we'll talk to you later.